good to start off, although every um, speaker or lecturer will know, that it's always good to start off with a joke. Um, and Chesson has many. I was at the airport on Thursday morning. I got up at 4.30 Thursday morning to be at the airport at 6.30. And I was looking for a Chesterton quote that would make you all laugh. Um, little did I know that I would be the joke. <laughs> because in true Chesterton style, I missed my plane. <laughs> so, I knew then that he was shining down on me. And um, <laughs> ever since I met Chesterton, which was around 15, 16 years of age, um, every writer I feel, my first degree was in English literature, and every writer that I've ever read has become a friend, if they're good, good writers and if they've got a good message. And he stayed with me, and I do see him as one of our garden angels. Um, and you may know that in, the, um, obviously in Rome, but UK have got it started. Um, there is this uh, hope that there's gonna be the canonization of Chesterton. So there's uh, a whole research going on with Father John Eudris. He's having to read through everything Chesterton ever wrote. Um, it's a great thing, but it will probably take all of his life. Mm. Um, and to, they're trying to work out anything dodgy about Chesterton, you know, how can he not be a saint? And this is what I'm going to talk about. One of my great um, problems in doing my PhD was the fact that Heathrock College was a Jesuit university as well in London, University of London. Um, they were not going to accept me on to do a PhD. And uh, at the time I thought, well, maybe I'm just not bright enough. I'm not intelligent enough. No, it was nothing to do with that, thankfully. Um, it was more to do with the fact that Chesterton was a big, fat guy. And how could this guy who smoked, drunk, drink, um, or drank even, um, how could this guy talk about holiness? And they gave me a very, very hard time in the interview. Um, I mean, I was close to tears because I thought, no, I really want this. I know that he's, he's really important for the world. And they said to me, you know, so how can you argue your case? It sounds as though, this is a very common term, um, you want to have your cake and eat it. So you want a man that um, lived life full of pleasure, but also spoke about holiness and said that there's a way to become holy in the every day. Um, this is a favourite um, image of mine, which is, um, it, for many reasons, is why I've got it up here. Uh, one, because it reminds me of me missing my flight. He often missed, as you had earlier, many buses, many trains. Um, he would walk along the street and lots of his notes would come out of his pockets, or even very absent-minded. But, um, yeah, so getting back to why um, it wasn't accepted, they basically felt that um, in order to be holy, and at the time, this was 2004, 5, um, you would have to be celibate. That there wasn't a way to be holy in the other day. I did a master's, I was talking to Sister Rani, I was doing a master's at Heathrock College in Christian spirituality. I was the only lay person in that lecture room. Everyone else was religious, priests, nuns, and this will shock you, or hopefully it will shock you, um, there was a big discussion on holiness today, you know, is holiness relevant today? And they said no. Holiness isn't relevant, the word is off putting and that's, that's the point there. The word has got historical um, negative connotation, so it reminds us of something way gone, something that is cut off from everyday life. And I sat there and thought, well, there's no point in us carrying on with our faith then, is there? Right. Um, what's the point in uh, being Catholic or going to Mass if we can no longer become close to God in the everyday? So that led me on to thinking, right, I'm going to do a PhD on the concept of holiness in the everyday and use this big guy as the, as the hero of that. Um, well, he is my superhero, basically, of holiness. <laughs> in the ordinary. So, my thesis was a study on how this 20th century writer's theological perception through his use of remarkable literary techniques managing to ignite the imagination and refresh the senses offers an original contribution 
to the current debates regarding ways of understanding holiness, particularly holiness as a universal call. And many of you here, I'm sure, same as me, remember Pope John Paul II. Um, I'm going to find it now. You have to uh, bear with me with this one. So this is one of the pictures they, they didn't like. Um, he's going to talk about holiness, <laughs> this guy. Um, he, he liked his food. Um, and what's strange is all my friends know that I like my food. You would never think I do, <laughs> but I do. But one thing I, I remember reading is that he thought so much that he forgot that he was eating. So I, I defended in that case, you know, you can, you can write so much and be in another entity thinking about things and not know you're eating, he didn't realise he was getting big. You know? I think the guy wasn't even, he didn't have that sort of awareness of, shall I look great today, you know, what shall I wear today? You know, his wife had to dress him um, in a cape, you know, and I, I like to think it was a superhero cape. But um, this is what I was trying to get to. So John Paul II said, thousands of young people on World Youth Day, many years ago now, but I still remember it, do not be afraid to be saints. Do not be afraid to be saints. And this is something historical. You can be saints now. So that's what I uh, chose to do my PhD on. Um, getting back to uh, one of the reasons why I felt close affinity to Chesterton was because he made many mistakes himself. And he said that mistakes and suffering and failures can lead to great things. And if there was one book that I would say to people to read if you're interested in spirituality and um, you know, awakening to this higher consciousness, becoming close to God, it would be St. Francis of Assisi. And he said, um, this is his own view of his stride towards sanctity, who he claimed this. In so far as I have had this experience, I may be able to lead others a little further along that road, but only a very little further. Nobody knows better than I do now that it is a road upon which angels might fear to tread. But though I am certain of failure, I am not altogether overcome by fear. For he suffered fools gladly, talk about Christ, he suffered fools gladly, he hung on that cross wasn't afraid to fail because he knew that in failure came heaven. Or what the world was failure, it was humility. Humility was going to bring, he bring heaven on earth. And one of my great passions, and why I'm going to use Chesterton now um, in my teaching a lot more, and the book that I'm rewriting, I'm rewriting my PhD into a, a popular book, a universal book, is this massive war between the soul and the ego. And Dale spoke earlier of the Dark Ages. Without a doubt, we are in the Dark Ages. It's frightening. Um, with each day that goes by, with each, I don't mind smiling, with each day that goes by, I think that the fight, the battle, is becoming more and more. And um, one thing <coughs> Dale reminded me earlier, we did think 14, 15 years ago, um, I think it must have been at the time, a bit older. Um, Dale gave me a pen of the Chesterton quote, and the pen is your sword. And I never liked war, I don't like battle, I don't like suffering, obviously none of us do. Um, but I wanted, I've got this strive, you know, like to fight for the good, fight for virtue. But you can do it by writing, you can do it by learning, you can do it through education, and that's the one thing that Chesterton taught me. And this, I don't know how many times this has come up today, but um, is that? if you think it's worth doing, it's worth doing badly. So years I sat there writing my PhD thinking, oh, will I ever get to the end? Will this be good enough? Every year uh, they would say, to, there would be, this was the worst thing for me, um, every year there was an exam to get to the next stage of the PhD process. They said, we still don't believe that Chesterton is a theologian. We still don't believe he's a philosopher. And they laughed and they said, how can a bumbling buffoon actually have something to say about God and holiness. And I said, and I cannot believe I was this confident with 
um, you know, academics are a lot more older than me, and they were the ones that were going to uh, help me, you know, pass this PhD. They said, um, I said to them, you haven't read Chesterton. You haven't read him. And it was, it could have come across as arrogant, but actually no, I was like, you don't, and this is another thing you'll find in life. People will read critics about Chesterton. Yeah, yeah that's right, people yeah. will read critics about Chesterton, and then they will not read Chesterton, and go around telling people, yeah, well, apparently he's really horrible about Jews. He's really, yeah. you know, he's like, I'm like, what? And I said, they're like, well, you're an expert. How can you do a PhD on someone that, you know, isn't very nice about Jews? Because he's best friends with Jews. I don't, have you not read his autobiography? No. Well, then go and read his autobiography. Read his stuff, and you will realise that this was a saint. This was a guy that knew heaven, and knew heaven was going to come on earth, but it meant that we really had to connect with our souls and with God, and that we could do it in the everyday world. Uh, one of the main things I've learned from Chesterton is that gratitude is one of the most essential attributes of being human and um, being thankful for the most small things. He was known, I think uh, Dale was at the talk and Marco was in Beaconsfield. Um, it was beautiful and I used it as a title of that talk many years ago now, um, 2015. Um, that Catholicism is the religion of little things. That it's about, he made me realise that you can find God, that you can find, this, there's a sacramentality, not only in Mass on a Sunday, but in the tiniest of seeds. If you really look, if you can really understand that, if you really understand that sacramentality is not just about the church and the sacrament of the church, but also because God created the world, therefore, He is in every single thing. And one of the things I noticed when I first started reading Chesterton, it, and I thought I was going mad. Um, I started to feel things. I started to feel the table. I started to really take in existence and realise the miracle of being here. And that's another reason why I, like, I really like St. Francis of Sisi. He talks about St. Francis of Sisi. We all know suffering. We've all been through something. You go down into the depths, right down into the depths of darkness. It's only when you're in the dark do you see the light. And on his deathbed, I, I do have this quote, but he said, on his, dying, on his deathbed, he said, I see it so clearly now. It's a battle between light and dark, between good and evil. And I said, that's odd, because you saw it right from very early on. And I thought, a simple statement to make. But he saw it so clearly, and he was for us. That wasn't for him, that was for us. That was a message to say, it's that straightforward. Choose your side. If you pick your side, it, each way, you choose the dark side, and that is why I like Star Wars, I bring Star Wars into my lecture because I'm never like, confused. Every film that you watch is about good and evil. It's about the battle between good and evil. And Chesterton was saying that if you pick the dark side, don't be surprised if that dark, that darkness gets greater. If you pick the good side, you will see miraculous things happening in your life. And one of the things is, well, the chess best. I, I am a great believer in providence, and if you pursue the good, the good will grow. And I don't know if many people here have had a law of attraction. No, it's huge in England at the moment. And it's basically, we're in an age where, as Dale mentioned earlier, depression is at its highest rate in the UK. It's highest rate. People are searching for happiness. They don't know where to find it. They look on the external, they look on the outside, don't know if it's, they just don't know where to find it. They're saying that if you focus on happiness, if you focus on positive, if you focus on optimism, which Chesterton did, you will become the most joyful human being there is. Uh, but if you focus on wallowing or blaming or anything that is of the negative side, you will become unhappy. Um, One of the, another thing that if someone said to me, you know, what would remind you of Chesterton? And this, is, this relates now back to the title of the talk on awakening and a cataract, a blindness over the eye. Um, from here. So it's getting used to it. I'm, I'm really terrible with technology. I'm still not used to it. Um, 
awakening. Chesterton is awakening us to the fact that we are in heaven already. It's a very, very hard concept to, to really accept when there's, as we know, there's so much war going on, there's lots of battle, there's a lot of suffering. But actually what he was saying is that, <coughs> my interpretation of what he was saying is that it starts with you. It's you hopeful in the time of madness and dark ages, but he says, he defiantly declares that we, that our eyes cannot see heaven. We cannot see it, there's a reason we cannot see it. And the problem he suggests lies not with creation, as I said, but with a person's tainted spiritual state of vision, sin. We don't like the word sin. So, um, again, sword, sword of surprise. So, a tip of the, I, another thing I would suggest you read are his poems. His poetry, beautiful. Um, and a typical example of this approach about removing the cataracts, trying to get us to see life for the first time. Um, is in the Sword of Surprise. And here Chesterton takes the reader to an uncomfortable place. He does that a lot. Take it, it makes you feel uncomfortable sometimes. I, I don't really want to read that. That's a bit a skeleton. He talks about the skeleton. He, talk, he, he takes us to places that unnerve us. It's a technique. <coughs> he, in this poem, he anatomically tears the body apart. Like a scientist, like a uh, yeah, it's like human anatomy. It's awesome. He says, "Sunder me from my bones, O sword of God, till they stand stark and strange as do the trees. That I, whose heart goes up with the soaring woods, may marvel as much at these. Sunder me from my blood, that in the dark I hear." that red ancestral river run, like branches buried floods that find the sea that never see the sun. He takes us through our very veins in our body. He takes us on a journey inside of us. So stripped and exposed and literally split asunder, splitting us apart, the skeleton is indeed stark and strained and yet no less so than the trees. We should not therefore be marvelling at our bodies as much as these. Should we not be looking at our bodies as if they were the most miraculous thing in the world, which they are? I've had a few people say to me, oh yeah, there's no God, there's no God, you know. I, yeah, it was an explosion. <laughs> um, I haven't studied science, biology, human anatomy. I did A-level with human anatomy. Um, I'm pretty sure that an explosion cannot create something as intricate as our human bodies, that it cannot create this strange emotions that go on inside of us of love, hate, jealousy, what, what that's an explosion. So it's, it's definitely not an explosion. And he says at the end, give me miraculous eyes to see my eyes. Give me eyes, an extra pair of eyes to see my eyes. Those rolling rivers made alive in me terrible crystal more incredible than all the things they see. That our eyes are more incredible than anything in creation. That's it, that's the end. I could go forever. <laughs> yeah, I have to stop somewhere. make a comment because I have to say two things smartly. One for the sake of everyone else. It's, it was Martin's father, who did it Martin, who is very, very much responsible for the cause for G.K. Chesterton being advanced. I had a correspondence going with the Bishop of Northampton that was very slow and methodical and he, he politely uh, Dismiss all of my letters. But Martin, Martin's father knocked on his door to go visit him personally and said, You have to do something here. You have to open, open the investigation of Chesterton's cause. And he also politely dismissed uh, Martin. But then something happened in, in England. Um, Cardinal Newman was beatified. And everything changed. Uh,
there was a new spirit of interest in, in Chesterton's potential part. And truly, um, the, the bishop was more responsive to our, to our request and to our petition. But he still didn't do anything. <laughs> but then Martin knocked on the bishop's door one more time and came and sat down with him and said, my lord, this is not going to go away. Uh, Dale Alquist in America continues to get letters and pressure from people who want to see Chesterton raised to the altar and, and made a saint. And then we also got this letter. And he showed the bishop a letter, and the bishop read the letter, and it said that it was from the a former ambassador from Argentina who said, we want to see Chesterton made a saint, and we want to know, is there something that we can do to help? Because he is responsible for many conversions here in Argentina. And our Cardinal Archbishop has just approved a prayer for Chesterton's intercession. And you see that this letter was not exactly an up-to-date letter, because three days earlier, that Cardinal Archbishop was named Pope Francis. <laughs> 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 <laughs>